Today we will talk about the topic of intercession in Islam. The very purpose of our creation is to single out Allah alone for worship. A worship of Allah is not accepted unless it's upon Tawheed. The pagan, the pagan Meccans to whom the Prophet sent, they would worship Allah, they believed in Allah, but they contaminated their worship their worship with shirk. Shirk nullifies your, a person's worship in the same way that impurities nullify a person's wudu. The essence of Tawheed is a direct relationship between man and God. The essence of Tawheed is a direct relationship between us and our Creator. Allah is not in need of any intermediaries between Himself and us. Now one of the claims made by the Sufis with various different groups is that the people who they call Wahhabis or we call ourselves Ahl Sunnah that we reject the intercession of the Prophet The reality is that for our history only a small minority of people or small groups rejected the intercession. For example the Khawarij and the Mu'tazila and others. As for Ahl Sunnah, as for those who follow the way of the Salaf, they affirm and accept the intercession. However, it's very important to understand two things. One is the various um, verses of Quran and a Hadith informing, informing us about intercession, to understand them correctly, the Akhbar, the information which Allah has given us. And secondly, to understand the rulings of intercession, because there are intercessions which are accepted and there's types of intercession which, are, which is rejected. So the, if, the issue of intercession or shafa'ah has some detail. We start with a definition, shafa'ah or intercession means asking an intermediary to plead your request in front of another person or deity. So a simple example would be if a man, uh, for example, he wanted to purchase a car. But the seller refused to reduce the price to an acceptable level. So he asked the third person to intercede on his behalf to, to reduce the price. That's a, that's a type of acceptable intercession. So it's asking someone to plead on your behalf in front of somebody else. Now intercession is of two types. And the first part will cover the first type, and the second part of the khutbah will look at the second type. Intercession is of two types. The first is intercession on the Day of Judgment. Intercession, the Shafa'ah, on Yom al -Qiyam. And the second is the worldly type of intercession. So let's start with intercession on, the Yom, on Yom al -Qiyam, and let's look at the various narrations that the Messenger of Allah has mentioned. No doubt, the person who will have the greatest honour on the Day of Judgment will be the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he will be able to intercede for the Ummah in front of Allah. But even this intercession that the Messenger of Allah will carry out, we ask it from Allah and not from Him. On the Day of Judgment, the Messenger of Allah explained that the standing on the Day of Judgment is a period of 50,000 years, and the people will be in a terrible situation. They'll be in turmoil and in a very difficult situation, such that they'll want the judgment to begin. Even those who are sinful or disbelievers will want the judgment to, to the, the actual judging to commence. So in the long hadith, and I'm not going to quote it word by word because of shortage of time, but in the long hadith the Messenger of Allah mentions that the people will look to those, of, those who are of high status amongst them and ask them to intercede to relieve them of the distress they are suffering <coughs> and that judgment may begin. So they'll start off going to Prophet Adam al Islam and they will mention his virtues, that he was the first man on earth, etc. And they will ask Prophet Adam al Islam to intercede, but the day of judgment begins. And Adam al Islam will refuse, he will remember that mistake he made, and he will refuse. 
So now go to Prophet Nuh Islam. And again the same will happen, Prophet Nuh Islam will refuse. And then they'll go to Prophet Ibrahim Islam, and then Prophet Isa Islam. All the Prophets will refuse to intercede in front of Allah for the, for the Day of Judgment to begin until they go to the Prophet Sallallahu himself and he will say, I am fit for that. Then the Messenger of Allah said, then I will ask, then I will ask my Lord for permission and he will give me permission. He will inspire me with words of praise which I will praise him. Words that I do not know now. So I will praise him in those words of praise and I will fall down prostrate before him. He, Allah, will say, O Muhammad, raise your head, speak and your intercession will be granted. Ask and you will be given, intercede and your intercession will be accepted. That's in Sahih Bukhari. So the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, will intercede for all of mankind that the horrors of the waking of a day judgment will be relieved of them and the actual judgment will be passed. This is the first intercession that will occur on a day of judgment and this is exclusive and specific to the Messenger of Allah. The intercession from the Prophet Sallallahu that the judgment will begin. And this is called the Maqam al Mahmud that we mentioned in our dua after the Adhan. And we ask Allah in our, uh, in our dua to grant this lofty status to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if you ask, if you make the dua after the uh, Adhan, then the Messenger of Allah said that his intercession becomes a obligatory upon you. So this is the first and great intercession. There's other types of intercession that will occur on the Day of Judgment, but again, some are specific to the Messenger of Allah and some are general. So what are the other types of intercession? We mentioned the one, the first one was the intercession, but the judgment begins. The second is that the intercession, but the people of Jannah enter Jannah, and that is specific to the Prophet Thirdly, but the people who enter Jannah will enter into a higher level than they actually um, were destined to enter. And again, that's specific to the Messenger of Allah. Fourthly, the Messenger of Allah will intercede for Abu Dhalib, but his punishment in the hellfire will be lightened. So he'll still enter the fire, but he will receive the lightest punishment. So these four intercessions are all exclusive for the Messenger of Allah. One is the judgment will begin. Two, the people of Jannah will enter Jannah. Three, the people of Jannah, their status will be raised. And four, for, four for Abu Dhabi. Now there's two other types of intercession which the Messenger of Allah will carry out. But also, they, these are general for other um, people or other and, and angels whom Allah chooses. And those are that the intercession for the one who was destined to enter the fire, his bad deeds are moving his good deeds, he was destined to enter the fire, but he doesn't enter it because of the intercession. And also, the sixth one, that the one who enters the fire, the people of major sins from this Ummah who enter the fire, they stay in the fire for a period of time, and then due to the intercession, they come out. So these are the types of intercession which will occur when? On the Day of Judgment. And all of, all of this intercession belongs to Allah. Now we will explain having a firm intercession and that we believe it occurs on the Day of Judgment. There are four important principles that we have to understand regarding this matter of intercession. And if a person doesn't understand these principles, this is where they go wrong and end up supplicating to other than Allah. Principle number one regarding the reality of intercession. Principle number one is for all intercession belongs to Allah alone. As other says in uh, Zumar, say, to Allah belongs all intercession. In the same way that Isra, Allah belongs to Allah. And the power to forgive belongs to Allah. And the power to, and the ability to give risk, to provide, belongs to Allah. Likewise, Shafa'a belongs to Allah. So in the same way that we don't ask for forgiveness except from Allah, and we don't ask for rizq except from Allah, likewise we don't ask for intercession except from Allah. Intercession comes under the sovereignty of Allah, and therefore it is not sought from anyone else, because nobody else possesses it. You cannot ask someone for something they don't have the right over, or something they don't possess. So that's the first point regarding intercession. Secondly, 
intercession does not take place except after Allah's permission, as Allah mentioned in Surah Baqarah. Who can intercede with him except after his permission? Thus, no one on the Day of Judgment can intercede unless and except after Allah the Most High has given that person permission to intercede. And also, even if Allah gives permission, it's not obligatory upon him to accept the intercession. That's the second thing. Thirdly, no one can intercede for anyone unless Allah is pleased with that person. So even the prophets and the angels cannot intercede for someone unless Allah is pleased with that person, as Allah says. And they do not intercede except for they do and they do not intercede except for the one with whom Allah is pleased. And one verse combines both of these second conditions. Allah says, and there are many angels in the heaven whose intercession will be of no use whatsoever except after Allah grants permission to whom he wills and is pleased with. In fact, the reality of intercession is that those who intercede are specific and defined. Allah decides who's going to intercede. And those who are interceded for, they are also specific and defined. The fourth point, Allah is not pleased except with the people of Tawheed, as Allah says, whoever chooses a religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted of him, and in the hereafter, he'll be one of the losers. So even Prophet Ibrahim al Islam, the friend of Allah, on the Day of Judgment, when he sees his father disgraced, and he says to his father, did I not tell you to disobey me? And his father, Azar, will say, Azar will say, today I will not disobey you. And then Ibrahim al will ask Allah, please don't disgrace me on this day. But his intercession will be rejected and his father will be thrown into the hellfire. So given these four principles, one is that all intercession belongs to Allah. Two, that intercession does not occur except with Allah's permission. And three, no one can intercede for anyone unless Allah is pleased with that person. And fourthly, Allah is not pleased except with the people of Tawheed. When, when, we, when these four principles are established, then it only follows that we ask intercession from Allah alone. In the same way that we ask for barakah from Allah alone. In the same way that we ask for forgiveness or for risk. Allah is the sole possessor of all of these things and therefore is shirk to us other than Allah. One of the definitions of shirk is to give a right to other than Allah, something which is exclusive to Allah. You cannot ask someone for something they do not possess. The reality of intercession is that it's a, mean of, it's a means of honouring some people and that it's a means of mercy for others. We mentioned that those who intercede are specific and defined. Allah chooses who intercedes. Those who are interceded for, they are specific and defined. Allah decides who's going to be interceded for. This is an honour for those who intercede and it's a mercy and a blessing for those who are interceded for. Now, if we, and I'm sure all of us, no doubt, every Muslim in fact, wants to be of those who on a day of judgment are interceded for. For example, a person may be someone of Jannah and he'd want the messenger of Allah to intercede that he has a higher status in Jannah. Or somebody may be destined for the fire and he would want the intercession that he doesn't even enter the fire but goes straight into Jannah. Abu Hayra asked a very important question. He said, radiallahu anhu, he said, O Messenger of Allah, <coughs> who will have the greatest chance to gain your intercession on the Day of Judgment? The Messenger of Allah replied, the one who will have the greatest chance to be granted my shafa'a, my intercession, is he who says, La ilaha illallah, sincerely from his heart. Hadith in Buhari. In this brief but important hadith, the Messenger of Allah explained in very clear terms the best way and the only way to, put, to obtain the shafa'a, the intercession of the Messenger of Allah, is by practicing tawheed and to leave shirk. Because the one who says the qalima sincerely from his heart, he will abandon every single form of shirk. Now, the irony is that those who go to the grave of the Prophet, or those who go to the graves of the awliya, to the darbars and to the mawlaziyams, they go there calling upon the deceased, saying, the reason we're doing this, 
The reason we go to the grave of the Prophet وسلم, and asking him for our needs or asking him to ask Allah on our behalf is because we want to be granted the intercession of the Prophet But the very act of calling upon the Messenger of Allah automatically disqualifies them from the intercession of the Messenger of Allah because that act of calling upon other than Allah is made a shirk. Asking the Prophet for intercession is the same as asking the Prophet for sustenance or for forgiveness. All of these things belong to Allah alone. Now, if they claim, one of the claims of the, of the Sufis is that the Messenger of Allah has, Allah has mentioned that the Messenger of Allah will be granted the intercession on the Day of Judgment. And therefore, I'm only asking the Prophet for something which Allah has already given him. Firstly, the fact that the Messenger of Allah has been granted this intercession does not justify you asking him. It is Allah the Most High who granted the Messenger of Allah the right to intercede, yet it is Allah the Most High who also forbade us on calling upon other than him. Allah says in Surah Jinn, verse 18, do not call upon anyone besides Allah. So the one who granted the Messenger of Allah intercession, Allah, is the same one who prohibited us from calling upon other than him. As one scholar put it, you, by asking the Messenger of Allah for intercession, have lost the right to intercession. That's the first point. Secondly, if they say that the Messenger of Allah has been granted a right of intercession and we're only asking him for something that Allah has given him, then we can also reply that on the Day of Judgment, and there's many hadith um, here, which I'm not going to read through them, but the meaning of the hadith is, or the various hadith, is there are a number of different people and angels who will intercede on the Day of Judgment. For example, as the angels will intercede. On the Day of Judgment, the martyrs, the one who dies on jihad, will be able to intercede. The, the awliya will be able to intercede. The child who dies before puberty will be able to intercede on behalf of his or her parents. So from this it's clear that it's not, intercession is not exclusive to the Messenger of Allah. So we say to them that if you're going to go to the grave of the Prophet and ask him to intercede on your behalf, which is shirk, then you should go to the grave of a child and ask them to intercede. Or, the, or you should call upon the angels and ask them to intercede. And nobody in their right mind would do this. Now although the intercession of the Messenger of Allah is greater than all of these other categories, the fact of the matter is, all of these other categories, the angels, the child, the martyr, the awliya, all of them also have, will be able to intercede on the Day of Judgment. So on what basis do you not ask them and ask the Messenger of Allah? Either you ask all of them or you ask none of them. So this is regards the intercession on the Day of Judgment. On the second part of the khutbah, we're going to talk about the worldly intercession. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah ala ba'ad. The brothers can move forward just to let the brothers in the side in. So the first part of the khutbah we discussed intercession on the Day of Judgment and we explained that it belongs to Allah alone, that it cannot occur except by His permission and that the one interceding can only intercede with the one whom Allah is pleased. And Allah is only pleased with the people of Tawheed. Now let's look at the worldly intercession. The worldly intercession is of two types. Type one, that which is within a person's ability to do. And this is also categorized in two sub-categories. So it has two conditions. So worldly intercession has two types. The first type is that which is within a person's ability to do, and there are two conditions. But this worldly intercession, for example, you ask someone who's living, alive and present, you ask them, for something, you ask them to intercede on your behalf. It can't, this cannot be done if it involves taking a right of somebody else. So you can't ask someone to intercede on your behalf to remove someone's right. Nor can it be done to, re, to prevent justice being established. For example, in the time of the Messenger of Allah, a lady from Banu Mahzum, she stole. So some members of her tribe they went to um, Osama ibn Zayd and they asked him to intercede in front of the Messenger of Allah saying, you know, please don't implement a punishment on her, it will be a disgrace for our tribe. 
This intercession, obviously, the Messenger of Allah rejected it. This is the type of worldly intercession which is not prohibited, which is prohibited because it involves preventing justice from being established. Also, in terms of worldly intercession, if you ask someone to intercede on your behalf, for example, you may ask someone, my child is sick, make dua for them. That's, that's a permissible type of worldly intercession. Your heart should be connected to Allah, your tawakkul should be with, upon Allah, not upon the person that you are calling, that you are asking. So an example of worldly intercession is the janazah prayer, where the people who are living, who are alive, who are present, pray for the deceased. And making dua for someone, is a, or asking someone to make dua for you or for your family, is a type of worldly intercession. And this, all of this is permissible. That's the first type of worldly intercession, the permissible type of worldly intercession. The second type of worldly intercession is that which is not permissible. And this is when someone seeks intercession from the dead for their worldly affairs. It involves asking a matter which only Allah has a right to be asked. For example, a person will go to the grave of the Prophet and say, Ya Rasulullah, ask Allah to cure me. This is shirk, and this is exactly what the pagan Meccans would do. They would go to their, to their idols and ask them to ask Allah, on, ask them to, to uh, make dua to Allah on their behalf. And they would say, these are our intercessors with Allah. Now, in the time of, when the Prophet Muhammad was alive, people would go to him and ask them. For example, a blind man would go and ask the messenger, went to the messenger of Allah and said, ask Allah to cure my blindness. Or the woman who suffered epilepsy, she went to the Messenger of Allah and asked the Messenger of Allah to supplicate to Allah to cure her from her epilepsy. So asking the Messenger of Allah when he was alive is permissible, like asking anybody else when they're alive is permissible. Um, but asking the Messenger of Allah after he is deceased, this is something none of the companions ever did. Rather asking the Messenger of Allah now, going to his grave and asking him to intercede, is futile from a number of different angles. Firstly, now that the Messenger of Allah is deceased, his intercession will only occur on the Day of Judgment. He has no power or ability to intercede now. In fact, he cannot even hear the supplication of those who make him dua to him at his grave. As Allah says, those who you call upon cannot hear you. So the Messenger of Allah, he can't hear your calls. And if they could hear you, they will not be able to respond to you. And on the Day of Judgment, they will reject your worship of them. Meaning you calling upon the Messenger of Allah is the same as is, is part of worship. Your worship in the Messenger of Allah. So it's futile from that angle. That the, the intercession of the Messenger of Allah cannot occur now because he's deceased. It will only happen on the Day of Judgment. Secondly, seeking their intercession of the Messenger of Allah, or of any righteous person, or any deceased person, I should say, is shirk, and it deprives you of the intercession on the Day of Judgment. Ibn Daymir Rahimullah, he made a very profound statement. He said, asking the dead to make dua for you, asking the dead to make dua for you is the essence of shirk. This is a, this is a very important point, because many people believe that if you call upon the dead, and this is what some of the deviant, deviant groups say, if you call upon the deceased, asking them to ask Allah, as long as you believe that all power and all ability belongs to Allah alone, and this person is immediately an intermediary, that's not shirk. But rather the very act of calling upon the deceased in and of itself is an act of shirk. Now, when people actually go to the graves of the Omiya, to their Dunbars, and these other places, the act of calling is shirk, but there's other forms of shirk accompanying this because du'a, calling, is not just informing. When a person makes du'a, it's accompanied with certain feelings of the heart. Du'a uh, calling that person, a feeling of loneliness, a feeling of incapacity, a feeling of weakness. Uh, all of these accompany the du'a and all of these feelings in the heart should be for Allah and Allah alone. <coughs> there's no difference between saying, Ya Rasulullah, cure my illness and Ya Rasulullah, ask Allah to cure my illness. Both of them are shirk. Obviously the first one is even worse because it, it's compounded the shirk. But when you call upon other than Allah, you've combined two things. You've committed shirk because you supplicated to other than Allah. And secondly, you've asked them for something which they have no power or ability 
uh, in. As Allah says in the Quran, and those who you call upon do not own even a thin membrane of a date stone. And Allah also says in a clear refutation of those who go to the graves asking for the intercession, Allah says, those who they call out to besides Allah, to those who they call out to besides Him, do not own the right of intercession. Now, finally, another doubt that they may bring is they'll say that the shirk of the disbelievers of Mecca, the pagans, was due to them worshipping idols. But we don't worship idols, we are calling upon the righteous. So how can you equate the two? So brothers, if you just move forward to the best of your ability to let the brothers on the side in. in. So, shirk is worshipping idols, we do not worship idols. So it's important to understand the nature of the idol worship of the, of the disbelievers in Mecca. What was the nature of the idol worship? The pagans of Mecca, when a righteous man amongst them would die, they believed, even though he had now died, he was still a wali of Allah, he was close to Allah. And therefore, his supplication was more likely to be answered. So they'd build an idol or a tomb or a structure over his grave. And that would be the focal point of their worship. They would call upon him by the, by the physical structure, the wood or the, uh, or the clay or whatever the structure was built upon, asking him to ask Allah on their behalf. They did not believe that the idol, sometimes they'd make an idol of him, the actual shape of him, uh, in order to focus their worship. But they did not believe the physical idol in and of itself could benefit them nor prevent harm from them, nor did they believe that the idol could actually heal them. The idol was just a means for them to reach this deceased person. And what were they asking the deceased person for? This deceased person, they were asking for his intercession in front of Allah, such that their supplication would be answered. Either intercession for a worldly need, or intercession on the day of judgment. And they would say, as Allah says in the Quran, these are our intercessors with Allah. Now compare this to what we see in the Muslim lands today. When a righteous man dies, they believe this person is a wali of Allah, and as such he's close to Allah, and therefore his supplication will be answered. So they build a tomb over his grave, and they visit the grave at certain times of the year, or any time of the year, and they call upon the occupant of the grave, asking him to ask Allah on their behalf. And if you ask them, why are you worshipping these tombs? They'll say, we're not worship, we're worshipping these tombs. We are calling upon a righteous man who is in this tomb, asking him to ask Allah on our behalf. So we, the Muslims of today, like the pagans of old, they don't believe that the occupant of the grave can benefit them or remove harm. Rather, the occupant of the grave is a means to reach Allah. They ask, they ask him to ask Allah on their behalf. And this is exactly what the mushrikeen of Mecca used to do. They would call upon their idols, which are representations of human beings, or some case angels or jinn, and they would call upon them, asking them to ask Allah on their behalf. So the acts, the, both acts are acts of shirk. Whether you call upon a prophet, a saint, an idol, a tree, or a celestial body, all of them are shirk. Shirk is not dependent upon whom you worship. Shirk is dependent upon the fact that other than Allah is worship. And finally, one of the ways, if someone comes to you with a doubt uh, that you're, you're unable to answer, one way, one answer you can give that kills all of the doubts of the Sufis, is you ask them, the action that you're doing at these graves, did any of the companions do this action? You're saying that you're in a time of need, and you're going to the grave to ask him to ask Allah on your behalf. In a time when Uthman radiallahu anhu was besieged in his house, and they were about, they were depriving him of food and water. Did any of the companions go to the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu and say, Ya Rasulullah, Uthman, his life is in danger. The hypocrites and the enemies of Allah have besieged him. Ya Rasulullah, ask Allah to save him. Not a single companion, not even a fabricated hadith, saying that the companions did this. And the companions, as we know, there's other trials and tribulations that they went through, but they never went to the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu and asked him, why would ask Allah alone. In the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, there was a, a terrible drought, Many people died, many of the animals died. What did they do? They asked the Prophet's uncle, Abbas, a living man, to lead them in prayer to ask it for, for rain. They didn't go to the grave of the Prophet and say, Ya Rasulullah, the animals are dying, the land is, um, is dry, Ya, ya Rasulullah, ask Allah for rain. Rather, they would always ask 
uh, Allah directly or we'd ask a living man to ask Allah directly because calling upon the dead is the essence of shirk. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shalallahu ilahi al-an astaghfirullah wa tundulik.